Hi folks, this is Thomas Linner, the Political Communi Communications Officer for the PSAC in the Prairie Region. Uh, we're just going to give a little bit of time for uh, stragglers to join us and all the rest, it being 7.02. So it will just be a couple of minutes and then we will uh, get going. So uh, looking forward to it. Hi folks, uh, Thomas Linner here, the uh, Political Communications Officer for the Prairie Region. We're gonna get started right away, uh, just doing a couple last minute things here. And uh, so just bear with us briefly and we will be started right away. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, first webinar of 2019 for the Prairies. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Marianne Fadoon. I'm the Regional Executive Vice President for PSAC Prairies, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your evening. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is we'll try to keep it to an hour because we know your time is, um, is precious to you. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an update on how bargaining works, how we got to where we are right now. Uh, and we have at least one bargaining team member that um, we'll hear from later, possibly two if he can get his connection from Panama. Uh, but uh, we're not sure if the internet connection will work uh, on that one, but you will hear from a team member. And then we'll have an opportunity for you to ask um, some questions. So just for some housekeeping for those who may not have been on a webinar before, uh, on your screen, you'll see uh, a chat box where you can enter any questions. Um, so if you're on your computer, you can, if you have a question, type it into the box and then it pops up on my screen. Uh, and myself or the team member will answer your questions as best we can. Um, if you are not on a computer and you're on a telephone, uh, you can text your questions uh, to, there we go, um, you can text your questions to Thomas at 
898-7002. And please include your name and your location in the text and then he'll bring it over to me or let me know and we'll answer it. So again, that cell number is 204-898-7002. And I'll repeat that again uh, in a little bit. Um, so yeah, you can type your questions in and we'll go from there. Um, we're gonna be focusing specifically on Treasury Board at this point. Uh, this will be the first of many webinars uh, this year, simply because it's a really effective way to uh, reach members in, in our vast geography. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? There we go. Um, so I, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. So for Treasury Board, we have five bargaining units specifically with Treasury Board. The PA team, which is um, mostly the admin and um, ad, admin type work. Uh, the SV, which is the trades. TC, which is the technical, uh, you know, a lot of the lab work. Um, EB, which is librarians and teachers, and the FBs, which are the Board of Services officers. Now, the FBs are not included in the information tonight because um, they just ratified recently and they're just entering bargaining. So the four teams that we're looking at tonight are PA, SV, TC, uh, and EB. If you're not sure which table you're in, uh, you can always go to the national website and uh, enter your employer and your classification and find out. Um, so the way we work uh, bargaining with Treasury Board is that um, input on bargaining demands comes from the members. So early in 2018, January, February, components uh, were asked to gather demands from their locals. So each component does it differently. So I can't speak to the exact process or who it was sent to or how it how it happened. Uh, but every component uh, is invited, uh, asked to contact the locals, and then invited to send in 25 bargaining demands to the National Bargaining Conference. So. Um, in that process, uh, that was done um, in uh, early January, and um, the bargaining conference was actually held uh, the last week, sorry, I had to just check my dates. Uh, the bargaining conference was held the last week in March. At that conference, every component gets to send delegates uh, based on the number of members they have in that table. And then PSAC also adds additional delegates, uh, members in good standing that are members of equity groups to ensure that we have a good diversity. Um, throughout that week, uh, everyone that's at the bargaining conference, there's an opportunity to go through the demands that were submitted by all of the components and do some exercises on what's a priority. So what's really important to the members. Um, so that happened at the end of March. And that was also at the time where we did elections of bargaining team members. Uh, currently, we have five members uh, on the four national bargaining teams. Uh, let's just flip to the next slide for a second. I'll introduce them. Oh, I guess I could do that too, sorry. Um, so um, we have on the TC table, we have Sherry Perrant, uh, who's a member of UNE from Winnipeg. Uh, on the PA table, we have Don Staruella, who is a member of USJE uh, from Regina. On the SV team, we have two members. We have Nestor Galarnik from the Union of Solicitor General Employees in Winnipeg. And we have Michelle Hambly, who is a member of Agriculture from Alberta. And on the EB group, we have Arliss Ibsen, who is from uh, the Union of Solicitor General Employees. Uh, you will hear from Don, and apparently Nestor made it on, so we'll hear from him in a little bit. Uh, so back to the flowchart. There we go. Okay. Um, so. 
by the week in March, um, all of the bargaining demands, we'd had the conference, team members had been elected. Uh, and so in May of 2018, the bargaining teams got together uh, and went through to create the final package. So we have two processes going. There's uh, table specific bargaining, but then a lot of other issues that affect all of the tables we've created in consultation with Treasury Board, we have a common issues table. So members from every one of the tables elects two people to send to common issues. So things like workforce adjustment, um, you know, some, some of the policies that affect everyone, those are negotiated at common issues so that you don't have to negotiate it at four different tables. Um, there was, so the teams met at the tables, and um, I am looking down at my dates, at, at my notes, uh, in May and June and October and November. Common issues met in July and October and again in December. Um, so where are we at now? So in October of this year, October 16 and 17, uh, PSAC, we tabled our monetary proposal. Uh, we tabled what we felt was a fair starting point for negotiations. We tabled 3.75% of a wage increment per year for four years. Uh, of course, there was no response from the employer at that time. Uh, and when they came back in November, uh, and I think this is this was uh, a turning point for the bargaining teams as well as a lot of members. The government, who says they respect our members, and and you know our prime minister, who you know told us before the election how they were going to respect us and the work that we do, they came back and offered 0.75 a year for four years. But as if that wasn't bad enough they said they don't want to actually implement it for 365 days and yeah we're not going to do retro pay uh basically folks at the end of the day this is a two-year wage freeze uh because if, if there is no retro pay and they take a year to do it uh and we're going to be a year into the the new collective agreement this is basically a two-year wage freeze so after after all of that uh, in discussion with all of the bargaining teams on December 10th, we declared impasse. So what that means, if those that are able to to look at the chart that's up on the screen, and, and uh, we will actually post this on the website, uh, it's an updated one. Um, the When we declare impasse, what happens is, is that um, either side can do that. And then because of the legislation, we're required to request a public interest commission. So the Industrial Relations Board um, goes to both parties and asks for chairs who we want as chair people. Uh, and they will appoint one chairperson and we get to appoint a sides chairperson. Uh, that public interest commission, which is known as a PIC, uh, will hear submissions from both sides and they will issue a PIC report that basically recommends the basis for a collective agreement. At the end of the day, it's non-binding. Um, you know, it delays the process. It could take two, three, four, five, six months to establish the pick. Um, then you do your hearings and it could take anywhere from two to six months to get the pick report. Um, and, and even when it comes out, it's just a recommendation. But the reality is under the legislation, we cannot go to a strike vote. We cannot go to any further step until that pick report has been issued. So if you are able to see it on the screen, you'll see one of two things happens. The pick report comes out and either both parties say, okay, we agree with the report and we have a tentative agreement that will come to you for a vote, or we don't agree with it and neither party is willing to go back to the table uh, or you go back to the table and there's there's no hope of getting an agreement um, at which point we are able to conduct a strike vote so to be clear at no point can anyone put you on strike 
without you voting on it. Um, the national president has to sign off to say, I authorize a strike vote. Uh, and it takes a majority of the members in that table to authorize a strike. And that would be done through a series of votes and information meetings and, and going out and talking to the bargaining team members. This is not something that that is going to happen until after the pick report is issued um, because we can't we can't go on strike until at least seven days after the pick report. Um, throughout all of this, um, the a, a recent development that I just got an update on today uh, is that we declared impasse on December tenth. And we went to the board and said, that's it. We want to pick established because they're not taking us seriously. They're not responding to things. We're done. Um, the government, the Treasury Board, has said they're challenging it. They don't believe that we're at impasse. They don't believe that we've had productive negotiations. Uh, and I will let Nestor and Don tell you about how productive we've been at the table at this point. Um, and so when I asked the question today, um, apparently what happens is because they are challenging it, um, the board chair of the Industrial Relations Board uh, is accepting submissions from both Treasury Board and from us as to why we believe we're at impasse and why they believe the employer thinks we're not, uh, and they will rule. Uh, if they rule that, you know, we've we have negotiated, we have discussed everything, and we are at impasse, the pick will be established. Um, I don't know how long that process will take, but while that's being determined, uh, the board has asked us to, to provide names of chairs. So that process is still ongoing, even though uh, we know the Treasury Board has, um, um, has challenged it. So that's, oh, okay, sorry, I didn't open the questions. So the question is, um, uh, what, what is a PIC? So I'll just um, say it again. It's a public interest commission, and it's something that's mandated through the uh, public, sa uh, public Service Labor uh, Employment Relations Board. Uh, P-S-L-R-E-B. Okay. Um, uh, and yes, I will address the other question. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, that um, this morning, yesterday, um, the a news report came out that Scott Bryson, who is currently uh, the president of Treasury Board has um, has announced that he is stepping away from his cabinet position and that um, it sounds like he's going to remain an MP until the uh, election this fall, and um, but he won't be running in the fall. We don't know what that means. Um, you know, it's the devil you know or the devil you don't. Uh, we have no idea who's going to be appointed. Um, apparently the cabinet shuffle will be announced on Monday, but you can be rest assured that as soon as we find out who the Treasury Board President is, uh, we will be in contact with them to see if, um, if they are going to actually give a mandate. Um, although whether the mandate, um, the mandate doesn't come from the Treasury Board President. So what is apparent at the bargaining table is that the people that actually sit across the table from our members and our negotiators, they can't agree to anything because they haven't been given a pocket of money. They haven't been given an envelope. Um, Scott Bryson, my understanding is that he at one point did not give a mandate, but I think it needs to come from Trudeau and from Bill Morneau, who's the Minister of Finance. So the reality is as much as we want to get the process moving and concluded so that you all have a wage increase that you deserve, uh, the government is stalling. For whatever their strategy is, it doesn't matter. 
Um, but we're saying that enough is enough. It's time. We're still dealing with Phoenix and, and to come back with an insulting wage offer. Uh, there's no point in sitting at the table and dealing with that. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think, uh, so what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to ask Don and Nestor to put their cameras up just so you can see them. Uh, and then there we go. Did it work? Okay. Uh, I can hear you, but I don't see you, Nestor. Do you have your camera? Your audio yeah, is working, um, but not your camera. Yeah, and like you and me talked about when you were in Mexico with the conference call, yeah. uh, thing has been going off and on and off and on. Okay. Uh, okay. Nope, it's not working. But, okay. do you, but you have audio, right? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm just going to hang on here for, for a sec. I'm going to go to Dawn, uh, and then I'll come back to you. Okay? okay. All right. Perfect. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce you to Don Staruella, who is uh, a member of the PA bargaining team um, and also a member of the Common Issues uh, bargaining team on behalf of the PA. Uh, she is with the RCMP in Regina. And I'm going to turn my mic off and, and uh, let Dawn give you her impression of how bargaining has gone so far. Thanks, Marianne. Um, hi, everyone. Excuse the headset. I feel like I'm piloting a plane here, but it's what works best for what we're doing here tonight. Um, as a member of the both the PA bargaining team and the Common Issues bargaining team, this is my first go at bargaining. Um, I've been a public servant employee for over 33 years, and uh, it's not easy to get on a bargaining team. Um, having been selected to represent at the PA bargaining team, I'm very honored, um, but it is certainly not what I expected it to be. Uh, I thought that uh, contract negotiations would be that, a negotiation, um, and it has not been that at all. Uh, very, very little of that, actually. Uh, so Marianne mentioned the dates that we have met and the dates that we've met with Treasury Board. And uh, the teams have put in hours and hours of work along with the negotiators and uh, Marianne and the other AEC officers um, to put together the packages that uh, you probably reviewed on the website or uh, had a chance to look at to see what proposals we put forward. It wasn't easy to pare those down. Um, and the intent was to pare them down so that we could hopefully expedite this round of bargaining. Um, apparently, Treasury Board didn't get that memo. Uh, they have come to the table with little or nothing. Uh, they keep telling us that, uh, that they want to talk about that, but they're not ready. They're not done their research. They need to look into things. Um, and we've come to the table and put absolutely everything we have on the table to talk to them about. And they've signed off on a couple of uh, housekeeping, just kind of changing language to catch up changes from last time, um, but very, very little. They've said no to a few things, which seems to be the only word that they know. And uh, it's been extremely frustrating. Um, it's been a great learning opportunity, don't get me wrong. I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Um, being on both teams has uh, meant that I've kind of done double duty with the travel and that kind of thing and been away from my work and my family. Um, for the greater good, uh, but however, Treasury Board doesn't seem to see it that way. And so the fact that they're objecting to our impasse, um, saying that we haven't talked enough and we haven't negotiated enough, it's certainly not because we haven't done our due diligence. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's on them that they weren't prepared. They didn't have a mandate. They didn't come to the table ready to bargain. Um, I guess I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, as a member of both of those teams, the people that I'm working with uh, when I'm bargaining have been fantastic. There are, there's a lot of experience on the teams um, and that's very worthwhile as well. Um, and if we need to go back, we'll go back and we'll consider con continue to fight the fight 
on behalf of all of the members. So. Thanks, Dawn. Um, so just a reminder to people that you can go and um, type your questions into the chat box on the screen. Or if you're listening by phone uh, and you're able, you can text any questions to Thomas at 204-898-7002. Okay. Uh, and so now we don't have audio or we don't have uh, video, uh, but I want to introduce Nestor Galarnik, who's a member of the SV bargaining team. Uh, and he is with USJE from Stony Mountain here in Winnipeg. Nestor, are you there? Hi, Marianne. You hear me? So, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry, everyone, that I don't have video, but... Uh... Well, we're new to technology here in Panama, so um, just to let everyone know that um, this is the first time I'm going on vacation in three years. Why three years? Well, uh, the second year Phoenix was introduced, well, I had pay issues, and the third year, pay issues. Uh, question or uh, challenge goes out to the members there is that I'm willing with the, the Manitoba uh, people, talk to your MPs, go out to your MPs. If you're not comfortable meeting with them, I will go with you, but they really want to meet with constituents. I met with mine uh, numerous times, anyone in the Cologne and St. Paul riding, I will go down gladly and go meet uh, Marianne Mahalchuk. I have no problem. I have no problem meeting any other MP. But um, this bargaining round was, it was a slap in the face when the uh, Treasury Board came back with uh, 0.75. And then uh, just be, I can't remember if it was just before Christmas or just before the new year, where they want to challenge uh, the pick. So, um go to the prairies website check out the bargaining team members give me an email if you want i will go with you guys or with anybody any sister or brother uh because this is important we gotta we gotta really get at the the lib especially the liberal mps and that and and i know marianne would do the same thing too in a heartbeat so because she's done it before and I'll, I'll turn on the mute, and if you have anything else to add, we'll take it from there. Perfect. Thanks, Nestor. Um, so, yeah, I'm, actually that goes into, um, I'll get to questions here in a sec. Um, but before we get into questions, so some of the questions is, what do we do now? And so I just want to say that one of the main things is we need to make sure that members actually... Um, that they know where to find the information, that they have the information, that they truly understand where we are in the bargaining process. Um, and so um, after each round of bargaining, there is a bulletin that's out. Uh, it gets emailed out to any member that has their email in the mailing list. So you can go to the national website, you can check off which bargaining unit you are, and you'll get the bargaining updates immediately. Um, we also have a process, um, and this is done nationally, but each regional office uh, sets up a regional strategy committee, uh, which is one member per local um, for Treasury Board. Currently, that's the strategy committee. If we were to be in a strike mode, that would become the strike coordinating committee. So I know that the regional offices have reached out, um, but if you are a local executive member and you've not decided who's going to participate in that, uh, we need to have every local represented because when we're making a decision on actions that we're going to take in any specific geographic area, we need to make sure that we hear the voices of all locals because every local is different depending on their membership and you know, where people are and what hours they work. And, and so uh, we need to make sure that, that every local is represented there. And Nestor's absolutely right. We need to lobby the MPs. Uh, while they may not say anything to your face, they won't make any commitments. 
uh, the reality is the more pressure they get when they go in the back room, they will pressure you know, the powers that be, whether it's the prime minister, whether it's the minister of finance, to say you better give them a mandate because they will go on strike. Uh, and so if it's something that's outside of your comfort zone, uh, absolutely, I will go with you. Trust me, there is not a politician I have shied away from. Um, in fact, I'm meeting with an MP tomorrow. Um, so absolutely, if you want someone to go with you, if you want to do some training in your local on how to lobby, we can do all of that. Uh, we can also do lunch and learns in your workplace. Uh, as part of the Here for Canada campaign, we can do an update. If a uh, bargaining team member is available, they can come in. Uh, if you're having a local meeting, if you're having an AGM, uh, contact, um, contact me. If I'm available, I will be there. If I can get there, I will be there. Uh, team members can do the same thing. Um, it was also, um, I was aware that I think there's some hesitancy around what you can or cannot do in the workplace when it comes to bargaining and political rights. Uh, so we will be looking at setting up a webinar for that uh, in the near future, probably in the next month or so, uh, with our legal counsel that can say, you can do this and you can't do that. Um, so we will look at doing that. Um, and, you know, as always, if your local wants to take action with an information picket, um, you know, if you have ideas for actions, by all means, let your regional office know. We will do everything we can to help you. So I am going to go to questions. Okay. By text. Um... I thought we were going to binding arbitration in January, uh, not for the Treasury Board. I think that might be stats. Um, yeah. Um, so at this point, we're talking about Treasury Board. We're going to be doing another webinar uh, probably next month that will encompass CRA and SSO. Uh, this is strictly for the four Treasury Board tables. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, sorry. Um, uh, since so the question is uh, from Morden. Since a pick decision is non-binding, does this mean we can go on strike if need be? Um, yes. Um, so a pick decision is non-binding. Um, as soon as we get the PIC report, usually we'll sit down with the employer and give it one last crack if they're willing. Uh, we are in a legal strike position seven days after a PIC report is issued if we have a valid strike vote. Um, so because it is an enormous task to conduct a strike vote because every member is entitled to vote, uh, you know, it, that usually takes a few weeks, and because they're only valid for 60 days, uh, I would suspect we wouldn't be doing a strike vote until we see the PIC report. Uh, and once we know if there's a mandate from the members for a strike and we're after the PIC report, then we are in a legal strike position. Okay, <laughs> okay, here's, here's a great question from Margaret. Uh, do you think the Treasury Board is stalling due to the upcoming election? I'm going to invite Nestor or Dawn to answer that if, if they have any comments on that. Oh, boy, do I ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, well, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, it wouldn't make sense for um, for the Liberals to basically peeve us off by not coming to the board or not coming to the table with a mandate and negotiating before an election. It really doesn't make sense in my mind for them to look what we did to Harper. We got behind that and it just, it boggles my mind why they would do that, but they, with Bryce and uh, stepping down, and like I told you, when I talked to my MP, um, and she specifically told me 
Bryson was told to have a mandate. And when I met her in Ottawa, uh, two days after we got the 0.75 response, uh, I don't know. It's, I'll let, Don, what do you think? Well, I think going into this, we thought that the pending election was going to be in, in our favor. We thought that that and uh, the Phoenix fiasco were going to give us some ammunition to expedite a round of bargaining and to hopefully get a fair deal from the Liberal government who said they respected public services. I no longer feel that way. I, I'm like Nestor. I'm baffled. I have no idea what their strategy is or what their intent is. Um, the fact that they've objected to our pick, uh, you know, like two weeks after we filed it, why wouldn't they object right away? I don't like the strategy is just beyond me. And like I said, this has been a little bit of a learning curve, the whole negotiation thing. So I don't know what's coming next. I don't know where they're headed. Who are they going to name as the president of the Treasury Board? And are they going to give him a mandate? to give to his negotiators because they certainly have no power at that table. Thanks, Don. Uh, thanks, Nestor. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, um, our strategy was to enter into negotiations right away. Um, our members have been impacted by Phoenix and everything else that's going on. The least they can do is come to the table prepared to negotiate a collective agreement with appropriate wage increments, uh, wage increases, with protections around Phoenix and, and things like uh, putting into the collective agreement about you know, compensation for our members that are affected by Phoenix. Uh, and and you know, they haven't been serious about it. So as much as our intention is not to embarrass them before an election, that just kind of comes naturally. Uh, but the the intention was that enough is enough. We're not going to drag out bargaining for three or four years because they don't want to deal with us before an election. And so whether they are stalling to put us off until after the election, whether they are stalling the process so that, you know, they can come back and actually give us a fair offer just before the election, who knows? Uh, but I'll tell you, it's a great question to ask an MP, particularly a Liberal MP. Why are they not giving a mandate? Because I think on behalf of all of the bargaining teams, one of the main things is, is that they're sitting across the table, um, you know, taking time away from their families, and there's no one to talk to. And that's got to stop. There's no point in agreeing to more dates and for us to send members on our expense uh, to the table when no one's negotiating. So give a mandate and we'll come back. Okay, uh, we have a question from Liz, uh, just asking for clarification on uh, what we asked for and what Treasury Board came back. And Liz, yes, we asked for 3.75% per year for a four-year agreement. Uh, and their response was 0.75% no retroactivity and 365 days to implement from the date of signing. That's also important. It's not from the date of ratification. Sometimes the collective agreement becomes uh, in force after it's ratified by our members. They're saying 365 days from the date of signing. If they delay signing, which they have in some situations, that could take, the clock doesn't start ticking. So they could sit on it after we ratify it for three months, and then the clock starts ticking. So a question from Bonnie. Um, does the union feel that they are in touch with their members, that given our current economy, the union feels that members would reject the existing offer? So, Bonnie, we've been, we've been doing uh, a lot of work. We've been uh, reaching out to members uh, through the regional offices, through the components. The bargaining team has been talking to members. Uh, and the reality is that with everything that our members have been put through, uh, the last few years, 
Um, we believe that members have said enough is enough. The fact that we don't have any resolve on Phoenix, uh, that members have had to fight for the most basic of things, basic pay, uh, and for the employer treasury board to come out with this wage offer, uh, we're hearing more and more that members are saying that's, that's not good enough. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're trying different methods to, to have those conversations. Uh, but based on the members that I've talked to uh, and, and what we're hearing, um, I, I believe we are in touch with the members and they're saying 0.75 after everything we've been through. Uh, recognizing the fact that we continue to go to work day after day providing service for Canadians, no, it's not good enough. Uh, so, um, you know, we don't have an offer on the table to accept or reject, um, but we'll see what happens after the PIC report. Uh, from Mackenzie, what's our number one priority in this round of bargaining? Um, is it wages? Well, you know, I think, um, and again, if uh, Don or Nestor want to add anything, wages is absolutely critical. And just just so you know, the 3.75 wasn't pulled out of the air. We have um, a, t a full team of researchers that work with our negotiators, and they look at everything. They look at, well, stuff that, you know, all kinds of reports. They look at GDP. They look at all the economy. They look at at negotiated agreements and other bargaining units and other workplaces. So it's something that's based on fact. It's it's credible research um, that you know we determine that this is this is what our members are worth and this is what we're going to put on the table. Uh, so Nestor or Don, do you want to add anything about uh, priority? Well, no, basically, basically, you hit it right on the head uh, with the research team because Pierre, uh, he's part of the, the SV, the stuff that he was pulling out and showing us um, from different uh, unions, different components, um, the, um, the inflation and everything, it was just the number, it, we were, how would I say it, we were uh, a little shy on 3.75 with all the data that uh, was presented to us, but we were comfortable with that number. So did you, Don, anything? Well, um, I know at the PA table, we had some uh, discussions about the 3.75 and, and came to agreement on that, but uh, people need to review the full package and realize that it's not just the 3.75 as the economic package that we asked for. Um, for each table has some specific uh, improvements there as well. And although money is always important because um, the cost of living is increasing every minute. Every bill that we pay every month is going up and our wages are not. Um, to say that that's the most important thing at the bargaining table, uh, probably it is. Uh, but there are some really, really important other things that are significant. And the purpose of bargaining is to improve our collective agreement, to improve work-life balance, um, to improve the health and safety of our, our employees. We're talking about things like childcare. We're talking about things like public safety allowances. We're talking about things like, uh, um, uh, oh, I just lost it there for a second, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, domestic violence leave, improvements to maternity and parental, improvements to family related. And those are all about um, work-life balance. So it's important to have a good monetary package, but it's also important to have those benefits available to us so that we're able to look after our elders and look after our children and um, our spouses and other, other extended family and that kind of thing. Um, we asked for improvements to bereavement and the definition of family and things like that. Um, so yes, money is important and, and Money is in the media when we're asking for money because we're looking like the uh, money-grabbing public service employees that don't do anything every day, right? That's sometimes the perception in the media, and we need to change that. Um, they look at us with our fat cat pensions, and, you know, you hear that all the time. But um, they also need to realize that we've been severely affected by Phoenix, 
and that uh, our wages have been losing ground. Uh, we were frozen in the 90s. We've gotten a pittance raise since then. We haven't kept up to the cost of living. And so that's just what we're asking for is to help us keep up with the cost of living so that we're not losing our buying power and therefore not supporting the economy as, as we should be. Okay, unmute would help. Thank you, Dawn. Um, so um, one thing that um, I did want to say, so all of our bargaining demands as well as all of the employer bargaining demands are available on the national website. So if you go to psacunion.ca, uh, and click on bargaining and then whichever table you're in, uh, you'll be able to see our proposals, their proposals um, are, are all listed on there. So that's that, um, you know, if you want to really break it down to your specific table, uh, you'll be able to find them. Um, I'm going to pump through a bunch of these questions quick because I tend to talk too much and I don't want to keep you out too late um so oh here's a great one so this is um this is for um uh for dawn and nestor uh it's a message from mandy who wants to say i just want to say thank you to the bargaining teams we appreciate all that you do for us mandy from local 40008 thanks mandy uh, and, you know, folks, uh, when your teams are at the table, those little messages mean the world. I've, I've been at the bargaining table and trust me, uh, they, they mean the world to, uh, to, to our team members. Uh, question from Rhonda, specifically how long of a time frame can challenging the pick cause? Um, we don't know. So it's currently, uh, it, this normally doesn't happen to be clear. Um, so we applied for a pick. That process to establish a pick is, is already moving ahead. Now that they've challenged the fact that we are at impasse, that is a separate process, but it doesn't stop the other one. So it's not like we have to finish one before the other. Um, and so if we don't get a positive decision, hopefully the pick, um, you know, that, that process continues. So my understanding from what I've been told is that because it's just a decision by the chair, uh, it is really quick because it's basically a yes or no. We believe that there's a lot of legal precedent around, um, um, declaring impasse and that, um, you know, our submission is solid, that we've done everything that we can. So there's nothing designating um, timeframes around that process. Uh, there was a question about the, I'm presuming about the regional strategy committees when the locals were um, asked to uh, submit a name for the strategy committee. Some of that work was done, I know, in December, uh, and there will be calls coming out, um, should be in January, to those where we haven't gotten a name yet. So um, if you have not gotten a call, but you would like to take care of that, you can call your regional office, uh, if you're a local president or a local executive. Okay, so question from Ray. So if the Industrial Relations Board um, finds that we are not at impasse, I assume we return to the bargaining table with Treasury Board. What if that cycle keeps repeating itself? Um, and so the reason they're saying we're not at impasse, so the one thing that has to happen before a pick is that there has to be discussions on everything uh, all the demands that we put on the table and that they put on the table. Um, once both sides say, okay, like we basically have talked it out, there's no way that we're going to come to an agreement on it, uh, then we're at impasse. So we can go back to the table um, and let them discuss what they want to discuss and declare impasse. And then they'll say, well, you are or you aren't. We can keep doing it every single time because the reality is they are not responding to anything. Uh, and trust me, I have had the, the privilege and frustration of sitting with the PA table and the common issues uh, at several sessions. And 
um, they're not responding to anything. There's nothing saying we can continue with that cycle, but at some point, um, the board is going to say, you know, the union has brought this up over and over and over and over again, and you haven't responded. You've had every opportunity. Um, so they will accept impasse. So it's not an infinite loop. Okay. Um, Dan's Canada Post was legislated back to work. Aren't we concerned that if we strike, it will happen to us? Yeah, it could. Uh, it absolutely could. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the, well, first of all, the best way to avoid a strike is to be prepared for one. Um, you know, I don't think they believe that, that our members, because our members have shown such dedication uh, through the Phoenix fiasco with continuing to provide service. Uh, I don't think that they believe that we will withdraw our services as is our charter right. Um, and will they legislate us back? Well, I think this government proved that no matter what they say, um, you know, they there's a very good chance they will do that. Um, but we have other strategies we can employ. Uh, we can do a work to rule. We can say no more overtime. Uh, no, I'm not doing someone else's job. There's a lot of things we can do. Uh, and we need to hold this government to account for what they did to the workers at Canada Post. Um, because that was an absolute shame and it continues to be a shame that this government legislated them back when there's already been a decision of the Supreme Court saying that it's their charter right. A uh, question from Audrey about is the compensation for Phoenix that the national president talked about aside from negotiations or is that part of the 3.75%? Uh, that is completely separate from the wage increase. Uh, negotiations are ongoing with Treasury Board uh, for damages for all employees who uh, are under the Phoenix pay system um, and either, you know, at, at varying levels, whether if you're under the Phoenix pay system, if you've been impacted and for those that have been significantly and seriously impacted. Uh, once again, no mandate from the Prime Minister. Uh, so those negotiations have not concluded, but that is completely separate and apart from the 3.75. Uh, question from Deborah uh, regarding is Parks Canada part of the SV? Uh, no. So the tradespeople um, at Parks Canada are under uh, Parks Canada negotiates one collective agreement for all their employees. Uh, that bargaining conference has taken place, I believe it was September, and um, they're looking at dates early this year to start negotiating, uh, keeping in mind that, you know, what gets negotiated at the Treasury Board tables does tend to, to you know, move over to parks and CFIA and CRA. Um, so what we're talking about tonight is for Treasury Board and doesn't include parks. Okay, the question on essential services that I was expecting. Uh, for those people who are designated essential services, are the letters we received before the Liberals were elected still valid now? Basically, you can throw all that stuff out. Um, when the Liberals were elected, they returned the essential services uh, process back to what it was before Tony Clement uh, declared himself as the ultimate being. Uh, so essential services basically says you need to continue to work because you provide a service that is essential to the health and safety of Canadians. Um, you will get a letter saying you are required to report to work. Um, what used to happen is that the department would give a list to the union representatives in the component and say, here's who we think is essential. Uh, the union would look at the list and say, we don't agree. They would negotiate. Uh, if the two parties could not agree, they would go to the board and the board would rule whether a position was uh, essential or not. 
what happened with the conservatives under Stephen Harper is that Tony Clement gave himself the ultimate authority to decide who was essential and took away any right of appeal. Um, the liberals, when they came in, signed a memorandum saying that they would revert back to the old system. Uh, and the legislation has just gone through that that legislation from the conservative government has been overturned. Uh, currently, we are in negotiations. Uh, components, uh, usually at the national level, are having discussions with um, uh, with the departments and going through the list. And um, so every component has a different process. You would have to check with your component specifically to see where they're at. Um, but that process also needs to happen before uh, we can go on strike. Okay. Uh, would a wildcat strike demonstrate our serious intention to strike? Well, as a union officer, I cannot instruct or or have knowledge of a wildcat. Um, um, but members got to do what members got to do. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, this goes in with the next question about the most effective way for members to help the union, uh, petitions, protests, you know what, all of that works. The reality is every time you do something in the workplace to support your bargaining team, to, to protest against Phoenix, to really make your voices heard, every time something happens in the workplace, your local management, um, it has to report that up and the more they see that this is happening um, from coast to coast to coast that members are actually supporting the union uh, and are are ready to take action and are taking strike training and they're taking union training uh, the more we do that the more they realize that maybe it's better for them to come to the table for a deal. Uh, so I would encourage you to have those discussions in your local, uh, to put your posters up, to, to put your buttons on, uh, you know, do shirt days, do different actions. Uh, those are all things that uh, contribute to getting the employer to, to realize that they need to come to a deal. Okay, are we going after separate compensation for those affected by Phoenix? Yes, that's what I mentioned before, uh, that um, those negotiations are happening at a separate table. We have a national union management table uh, specifically for Phoenix that Sister Magalie Picard, our national executive vice president, co-chairs. Uh, and so those negotiations are happening at that table. Um, and again, they're waiting for a mandate. Okay. Uh, thanks. This is from Doug. Thanks for the wage level increases. This seems like the first contract that we've even looked at getting inflation as my buying power has decreased by over 40% since I started in 20, 2001. But has uh, any other demands been discussed and decided upon? Uh, very little has actually been agreed to at the bargaining table and basically anything with money, uh, none of that has been, um, has been agreed to. Okay. Um, I know we're getting close to the time, so I'm just going to go through a few more questions here. Uh, if we did go to a strike vote, when would the earliest would that uh, occur? Some members are worried that they don't have emergency funds rebuilt due to Phoenix. Uh, that's from Drew, and thank you. And that is absolutely something that we acknowledge. Uh, there would, I, I mean, I can't say for sure. Uh, it would, it could take, you know, a few months. It's going to be at least into the into the late spring. Uh, before we even start talking about it, it will depend on when the pick is actually established uh, and when we have those dates. And, um, you know, because you can factor in two, three months from that point um, before we would be in a legal strike position. And like I said, it still takes us, you know, three, four weeks to be able to conduct a strike vote uh, because every member has to have a right to do that. And that's a lot of members and we need to make sure they have an opportunity. So uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next month. 
Um, but it's not something that will take you by surprise. We will, we will keep you updated. Um, a question from Joel, as the pick decision is non-binding, did we have to go there and could we not just go on the strike vote route? Um, you know what? Uh, I agree with you. It at times seems a waste of time, but the reality is it is the legislation we're under. Uh, we have no choice. We have to go through the process. Um, and um, once it's done, then then we can go the strike route. But it is contained in the legislation, so we have no choice but to go through that. Um, the other request is, uh, other than a wage request, what have we asked for? Uh, and so I would invite you to go to the national website. And like I said, you can see all of the specific proposals. Uh, for each of the tables because it's huge packages uh, specific to members in that um, in that table. Uh, question from Darlene, should we wait till the next election to negotiate to table this as an issue to make the men's meet? I'm not sure I get that. Um, Sorry, Darlene, if you can maybe clarify that question, because I'm not quite sure where you were, where you're going from that. Um, oh, we have um, a message from Omar, who is a member of the parks bargaining team, uh, just to say, yes, parks is meeting at the end of January to prioritize their demands. Uh, but of course, Treasury Board has a huge bearing on what happens at parks. And so at some point in the future, you will be seeing Omar up on the screen when he gives a parks update. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question from Catherine about what if local management doesn't take it up? And I'm not 100% sure um, what that means. So if you want to clarify that. Um, and oh, Audrey, they've already told their managers in their office to be prepared for strike action. And I'm sure you sent them into a scramble and there was a lot of emails and stuff going on after that. So, um, and some thank yous from some members for the webinar. Um, so we're a little bit after eight. I'm going to text question. Oh, shoot, I forgot. One sec. Oh, okay. There was a question. Um, a question from Sheila. So they want to give us 0.75 for four years, but not start it for a year. And that's a year past the expiration of the collective agreement. And you're absolutely right. And that's how we get the two year wage freeze because it's not, they're not going to do retro pay. So if we're a year into a collective agreement before we come to an agreement, wage freeze, no retro, 365 days to implement, that's two years. And. Oh, and the other question was about meeting with MPs, um, uh, whether it's worth going to other parties, be it conservative or NDP. It is always worth it to talk to your member of parliament. Always, always, always. Uh, and so while, you know, they're going to sit there and say they're not government, well, who knows when they might be government, right? Um, they need to know you, they need to know your constituent, they need to know your face, they need to know what you do. Uh, so please, 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 um, you know, if you haven't, um, um, talk to your MP regardless of the party. And should we make, okay, Darlene's question, should we make it an issue with our MP in the upcoming election? Again, absolutely yes. Um, we need to make sure that going into, there's going to be a lot of work around the federal election. You'll be hearing more about that uh, because we want whoever is going to be the employer for our members, we want them to know what we do and that we deserve and demand respect. Uh, and so we will be providing opportunities for you to have that voice and to, and to participate uh, in basically electing who our employer is going to be uh, in the next round. So 
um, Um, so one last question, are any of the other unions in agreement to hold off with finalizing negotiations at a lower wage increase or are they moving forward? Um, you know what, at the end of the day, we are the largest, um, the, we, ha we have the largest membership with, with uh, the federal government uh, and we're negotiating for our members. Uh, I'll, I think some of them, I don't know if anybody has actually concluded an agreement, uh, but I'll be honest, I, I don't follow all 17, well, there's more than, there's 17 unions, but there's a lot more collective agreements. Um, and so I'm not necessarily, I don't wanna say 100%, uh, but I don't think there's been much agreed to. I will say that we've been working with the other unions on on the Phoenix issue and, um, we tend to take the lead uh, because we have the most staff resources, we have the most legal expertise, uh, we have the largest network uh, across the country, you know, um, community to community. Um, so that at the end of the day, um, we will do what's right for our members and we will do what our members uh want and what they tell us and so uh we would encourage you to talk with other unions but um uh we're we're following our own strategy so okay on that note uh we are a few minutes after um i'm just gonna don or nestor did you wanna do any final words before we sign off I just want to thank, say thank you for anyone that actually listened and participated, and I will see you in Canada next week. Thank you. Thanks, Nestor. Don? I just wanted to say the same thing and to just uh, reemphasize what Marianne said about your support is so important as we move forward through this bargaining process, whether that's, you know, sending emails, uh, signing petitions, visiting your MPs, which I have not yet done, even though I took the training, but I will get there. Um, not my comfort zone like it is Nestor's. Um, and, you know, any support you show us is, is greatly appreciated and your participation in something like this is very valuable. Take it to your workplace, pass it on to those who couldn't be here tonight. Um, unfortunately, uh, Justin Trudeau is in Regina at the University of Regina tonight and there was a rally there for Phoenix and I needed to be here instead so I'm not freezing my butt off out there but I'm hoping a lot of my uh, co-workers and brothers and sisters in the union are there. Thanks Don and uh, last word I had is that we do have some members in the room I don't know uh, if they're going to be able to ask any questions uh, directly the Prime Minister but but I do know we've got a few people uh, in the town hall meeting and um, you know, if we get some information. Uh, so I just wanna say uh, on the screen, you'll find the phone number for my office, uh, my email address, the website for Prairies, uh, where you can see a lot of information. That's where you can go and actually see the pictures and the email addresses for all the national bargaining team members. Uh, and the Prairie's Twitter account, the my personal uh, Twitter account, and um, also the Facebook page. So I would encourage you to do that. I'd also encourage you to go to the Prairie's website right now. Uh, and if you haven't done it, go to the contest uh, and enter your contact information. We want to update contact information. Um, and um, uh, you can win a uh, one per province, a $500 gift certificate for unionized grocery or uh, unionized travel. And, um, and we'll be able to communicate with you just to make sure that we have the up-to-date information that closes January 31st. Uh, and um, so crude number of participants for the webinar, well, we had 200 registered, we had about 80 show up. But you know what? Uh, I don't care if it's two or eight or 200 or 2000. Um, I wanna thank you for taking time. We will continue to do these um, on a regular basis uh, so that you get to meet the other bargaining team members and get uh, more updates. And if you have any ideas, suggestions, stuff you wanna do, any questions whatsoever, 
uh, by all means, contact me anytime. And with that, I will say thank you again and good night.